Oh, Sarah, we're ready? Yep. This is, this is live from the table, the official podcast of New York's world famous Comedy Cellar coming to you on Sirius XM 99, Raw Dog, and on Ridecast Podcast Network. Dan Natterman speaking, co-host of Live from the Table with Noam Dorman, the owner of the Comedy Cellar and the other co-host, really the main host, let's face it, he does most of the talking typically. Uh, we also have Perry L. Ashenbrand, who is a producer and sometime on-air personality. And with us is a comedy seller, comedian Ian Fidance, comedian, actor. Uh, he co-stars in this season of The Last OG on TBS and was a regular at the Comedy Cellar in Greenwich Village before quarantine. Michael Moynihan is with us. He is a national correspondent for Vice News and co-host of the popular Fifth Column Podcast. Welcome one and all to our quarantine edition of Live from the Table. Daddy, I love you. I love you too. That, that was, that, I don't know who that was. That, that was, was perfect. That was perfect. Now, was Dan, that a soundboard? I, did you just press a button? I don't know. Dan, can you read out their bio? Days. My All secret right. is safe with you guys, right? <laughs> Did I did I read in Ian's bio that you had the number one record on iTunes, Ian? Yes, it's true. Yeah. For well, a couple days. How did something like that happen? Uh, I don't even know. Luck of the draw, I guess. Some some glitch in the algorithm, I think. But uh, I think sometimes when a uh, an album comes out, it's number one, and then it, the 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 question is is how long does it stay number one? Well, uh, I didn't. I didn't have any pre-sales. Usually, it debuts uh, on pre-sales. You know, it it came out and uh, was it, great it, cover it, art. Great cover art. Okay, this one. I'm, I think it's amazing. Cover. That's amazing. Go ahead. Go ahead. Sorry. Go ahead. Uh, no, it 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 came out and it hovered at like three two, and then it stayed at one for a couple of days, which is nice. And then you know the the mainstays in the top ten are always like two Mulaney albums, two Gaffigan albums. You know. Uh, Jeff Dunham was kind of near the top, and, and I was like, look, if I can't beat out Jeff Dunham, I, I at least got to use this money to get a rope and a chair, you know. So. Jeff Dunham is a ventriloquist, so his, his albums have to be video, or it doesn't really, uh, it's not particularly interesting. Which is why if I didn't beat him, it was going to be lights out for old Ian, you know. And you can so, still picture it. You can still picture it. Yeah, you just got to close your eyes and have an imagination. Well, I guess part of ventriloquism is the words that are being said, are they funny and the characters? And, and the other aspect of ventriloquism is the technical mastery of the ventriloquist craft. There's some okay. ventriloquists that are incredible ventriloquists. They can drink water and make, but they don't have anything interesting to say. And then some yeah. aren't very good at that part of it, but are funny. So I don't know where Dunham well, falls in. I, yeah. I don't watch the guy. I gotta be honest, you have the perfect ventriloquist dummy voice. I would love to get your hand out of my ass. I'd love to shove my hand up your ass and just make you say things. You know? Hey, I'm the dummy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> there it is. I mean, all I right, do all so, those lines. So, uh, so uh, don't ask okay. me. I'm made of wood. <laughs> um, so I just find out. So, uh, you, Ian, you and you and Michael Moynihan are friends. Uh, are we? Are we? I don't know. I don't know. We, have, they we met, met, right? We met they once. They out at the table one yeah. night. Yeah. And, uh, really yes. vibed over some old yes. punk rock. Yes. Oh, that's right. We were talking about old punk rock stuff. Yeah. Yes. I didn't know yes. I was talking to the guy that has the number one album on iTunes. Well, Which, by the way, can I ask that? That means people buy it, right? Because yeah. if it's on, I mean, it, so is it not on Spotify? It's so, on Spotify. Well, it's why do on they buy Spotify. it if it's on Spotify? Because there's a lot of Fidaniacs out there, and oh, yeah. you know, there Huge. it's higher Fidania fidelity. Yeah. Runs rabid, man. You know, and also a it flak plays, file. Yes, it get, it get it's gotten a lot of plays on Sirius. They spun it like you know, like 15 times already, which is great. So, wow, so you're making money too. I'm I'm making Amazing. money in the core, baby. I'm living Look my at that. I'm trying to, you know. So. Okay, so, so, but, so oh, I thought, I, 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 wait, let me ahead. tell you. So, after the first time we had Michael on, yeah, Ian sat down and you guys had gallivanted off to do God knows what, and the two of them went on like this insane punk rock rampage that yeah. was so 
was sort of like mind blowing. What were we, I don't even remember who we were talking about. Like but most uh, obscure references. Do you, you guys remember this? Am I making yes, this yes, yeah. I do. <laughs> totally. And it was funny because I was, I was emceeing downstairs at the time. So you and I would be like, oh my God, you know, when television debuted. Oh yeah, yeah. Marquee Moon came out. Yeah. 79 <laughs> and Marquee Moon came out. I couldn't believe what Richard Hell was. I got, I got to go and bring then up. And he disappeared. Tom yeah, Lee, I mean, right back. sat there by myself for a little bit drinking. And, uh, I know. Unfortunately, I don't know uh, much about punk rock. <laughs> I, I didn't think you would, Dan. It would be pretty I know, incredible uh, if you, you know, did. The Ramones, obviously, are punk rockers. And are the Dead Milkmen, is that punk rock? The Dead Kennedys. Uh, Dead Kennedys, for sure. Yeah. Yes. Well, Dead Milkman. Who had the song Punk Rock Girl? That was the Dead Milkman. Dead Milkman. Who I believe are from Philadelphia. Philadelphia, baby. Yeah. That's right. <laughs> yep. And is, is Punk Rock Girl a punk rock song? No, it isn't. Well, it isn't. Well, it's an would, homage to punk rock, but it's not a punk rock song. I would it's argue it's in a way that it song. could be, because punk rock is really kind of uh, going against the grain and doing something that you want to do for you. So in a way, it has like a punk rock feel, but by it's not really like a punk rock genre song. I think that's a good way of describing it, yeah. The Dead yeah. Milk, I mean, sorry, Wikipedia describes the song as cow punk, cow pop punk, punk and comedy yes. rock. Yes, it does re reference uh, Mojo Nixon and Skid Roper, so it is like kind of a cow punk. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. I've never heard of comedy rock uh, before. <laughs> that's the that. genre of my album. That's why it went to number one. <laughs> I've always maintained that a song can even- <laughs> It was number one in that subgenre. Number yeah, one yeah, in yeah, comedy yeah. rock. There's a, there's a big <laughs> asterisk next to the number one on iTunes for me, you know? I've always maintained that a song can be funny or it can be a good song, but it can never be both. Uh, yeah. it, it, I, I, I disagree. Have you ever listened to the Lonely Island? No. That's uh, what's his name? It, Andy Samberg. Andy Samberg. Um, yeah. Jorma Tacone. They their their group actually put together like their their parody rap songs, but they're so catchy and like produced so well that I I feel like like I used to listen to them. And I was like, this is funny and good. But you're you're right. It's very rare that the two mesh together well. Maybe there's exceptions. Uh, uh, there was a guy named Jim Stafford in the '70s who used to make like funny songs that were that were um, still kind of hits. It's 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 a tough thing. Uh, Roger, Roger 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 Miller Roger Miller had a few songs that were funny and also musically. Well, what what song was that that was funny and musically interesting? Like "Dang Me, Dang Me," "Gonna Take It Off to Hang Me," "I'm to the Highest Tree," <laughs> you know things like that. I really could have done that better, but well, maybe I think I think as a general matter, if you can write a great song or if if you're capable of writing a good song, uh, why make it funny? Because that's going to it's going to degrade the the, the impact of the song. I and mean, if you can write November Rain, why do you want yucks? You've got everything you want because because you're not. The video is pretty yucks. funny if you've ever seen the video. Oh, which has which has Slash doing a guitar solo in front on of the top turf. of what I believe is a it's called a mesa. It's like in the middle of like Arizona, and he's playing a guitar solo. That, and that's he's, pretty good. He's playing a guitar solo. It's not even plugged into an amp. Yes, so he's basically right. playing air guitar in front of a church in the yeah. desert. In the desert. <laughs> yeah. In the desert. I thought yeah. it was And that, by the way, was a great. It's a great monument to the forgotten relationship of Axl Rose and Stephanie Seymour. Uh, the the uh, once uh, and great supermodel who then uh, married some uh, socialite guy. Okay, well here's so here's an example. Um, okay, musical theater. <laughs> no, by the way, why is your uh, video? It's like in black and white. I feel like I, I don't have my usual background. Hold on. It's can, um, can I tell it, you? It, it looks like a Navy Seal helmet cam. This is like this. It's like bright but black and white. Yeah, I find I know, that black and white kind of hides the fact that I, I haven't been keeping up with my hygiene. <laughs> I mean, gnomes, gnomes, gnomes aesthetic right now totally matches how he feels. So yeah. it's, it's so, gray. But, it's not, it's not sharp. It's very scary. Yeah. I'm going to nominate as the most musical, funny, basically funny song, funny lyrics uh, in history. Um, uh, two of them. Uh, I want to be, I want to, I want to be in America from West Side Story and yeah. Officer Krupke from West Side Story. Yeah. Both so two West Side Story choices. Yeah, yeah. Wow. So, so you know, in the context of musical <laughs> theater, it makes sense to be funny and good music. And then, of course, whimsical is not funny, but like you know, Maxwell Silverhammer or something. You know. Yeah. yeah. So, so um, 
But you know, my, anyway. I watched uh, that movie with my daughter recently, who just turned nine. And uh, her first comment after 30 minutes was to turn to me, I sort of go, turn to me and she's like, Papa, they're not Puerto Rican. And I'm like, no, I know, they're, they're all Puerto Rican. <laughs> and I was like, you know, it's, it's a fair point. I was like, yeah, I don't know how to explain this, but yeah. But Rita Moreno is Puerto Rican though, right? Yeah, yeah. She's, I think she's the sole Puerto Rican in that movie. So the reason I, I tuned out for a minute is I just ordered an a, a antibody test. Oh, and, yeah. yeah, and before I, but then you have to decide where you want to take it. And so I was, um, comparing zip codes to coronavirus numbers to see which, <laughs> which, which place would be the safest place to go take it. So I'm going to go take it in Mount Kisco, New York. Uh, I'm scared. No. I mean, that okay. would be just my luck to catch coronavirus going to take an antibody test after staying home for three months. But yeah, why are you taking an antibody test? You haven't left the house in like 90 days. Um, I had a bad cough that was not like a cough I'd ever had before uh, at the top of this. And um, <laughs> after hearing all the stories about so many people who had symptoms similar to what I, what I had, who had it and having one, what is it? Uh, what do we say? Two, two out of 10 or three out of 10, two and a half out of 10 New Yorkers having the antibodies. Two mm -hmm. out of three ain't bad. Meatloaf. Two out of, anyway. Yeah. I mean, I'm going to, oh, that, yeah, that's a funny song. Uh, um, so I'm going to, I would like to uh, take the test and just know. You have been poo pooing the fact that I was like deathly ill on my couch for a month, telling me that I probably didn't have coronavirus, and you had a little tickle in your throat. No, I had a bad I cough. It wasn't a little tickle. I had a bad cough, um, but I just didn't, you know, kvetch about it like you and, and look for sympathy. But now that, but, I, now that I, I, I kept it to myself. Now, okay. now, Noam, as someone as brave as you, I have to ask. Um, did <laughs> that is, did, bravery is my middle name. Did, did anyone in your house get sick because you had the cough around all of them? My wife had, the, my wife, uh, had a cough too, and my kids all had fevers, actually. But, you know, with kids, the symptoms are very yeah. weird. Now, so. at, at, eight, at 7 o'clock, we clap for the nurses. At 8 o'clock, we should clap for Noam, I think. Yeah. I think that's what I've been doing do. that, actually. Yeah, yeah, no yeah. one knows what I'm doing, but... <laughs> you know, I didn't make fun of your number one on iTunes. And, you know, <laughs> <laughs> Okay, and what kind of numbers you got to sell to be number one on iTunes comedy? <laughs> and, all right, let me tell you something. It's Photoshop, okay? You hired a guy. What are those numbers, then? Because when I worked in publishing, the They're best seller, New York Times bestseller list used to be you had to sell like 60,000 books, and then it became like 10,000 or like 8,000 when they were just in print. But like, if you have to sell uh, on iTunes, because you can buy individual tracks too, can't you? Yeah. So does that all count towards the total? Or do you I, have to it, buy the full record? I, I think it's just total buys, whether it's a track, whether it's an album. And well, uh, you, you don't have to tell us how many buys you need to be number one on iTunes, but just tell us how many did your mother buy? <laughs> I mean, she has so many Both accounts, purchases. she lost track, no. <laughs> so, all right. So, uh, uh, so we're going to get into some, uh, some events of the day since we have an esteemed uh, brainy guy on the, on oh, the show. Shit. What happened well, today? What particular events um, well, been, are you thinking of? Well, the, the, the hot events in, in, my, in my arguments have been the Arbery case, uh, yeah. masks. Um, what else? So this, this, I, I'm, I've decided that this guy that we had, Alex Berenson, is kind of a charlatan, by the way. Um, he's a bit of a crackpot. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, so nothing he said. I, I would say he's more he's more right than wrong, but his delivery on Twitter is leaves a lot to be desired. N nothing he said when he was on our show seemed to be all that ridiculous, and we had no. Just, well, so let's just so the, so so Alex Berenson is kind of this Alex Berenson is this COVID skeptic who's been um, gotten a big following on Twitter, um, kind of like poking holes at 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 our breathless reaction to this and our overreaction to it, and it was an article. I don't know, was it Vanity Fair or something like that uh, about yeah, him? And, um, and yeah, and he was very reasonable when I presented him he with data on the show. I presented me. What's that? He didn't seem like he was a skeptic when he was with us. Yeah, well, that's what he's known for. So he was very reasonable. reasonable. With me, but but anyway. I presented him with data about masks and, and charts. And I had done like a real deep dive on the mask thing. And then he said, well, yeah, uh, that's interesting data. Send it to me, blah, blah, blah. And I sent it to him and I never heard back from him. And then he went on Twitter. I just checked it today. Like just, like just deriding the whole idea of wearing masks with no data whatsoever. He never, he pretended he didn't see all the studies that I sent him, which are recent studies showing so I, how, how, how strong an effect masks might have. And um, so I just think he's just kind of a phony. I don't know. 
Well, you know, I think a lot of people have a particular brand on, on Twitter and elsewhere they're trying to protect. And if, if the evidence shows that they're wrong, they ignore it because it's not in keeping with their brand. They're going to lose fans. So then let's start with this because th that um, reminds me of something. I've been kind of defending, not defending Trump, but making the case for a long time now that the real dangerous decisions, the ones that have really cost a lot of lives, were not Trump's, they were Cuomo and de Blasio. And there, and there does seem to be a, a, a consensus forming on the left and the right now. I don't know if you saw this article on Michael about on ProPublica, like just going through all the horrible decisions of de Blasio and Cuomo and- Yeah, and yeah. I mean, I've been, I've been, I did a piece that is airing on Sunday, I think. Uh, yes, yeah, this Sunday, I think, on Showtime, where um, the one, one of the uh, scientific experts I have on is uh, Dr. David Katz, who wrote right. the first piece in the New York Times that, get, that got him in a lot of trouble. He's, he's been far more right than wrong, and he's very, very reasonable, very level-headed, and said, you know, people misunderstood what I said and called me Trumpian and the rest of it. But in the process of preparing for that interview, I went through everything that Cuomo and de Blasio, and it, the most amazing thing is the Cuomo thing, is these people swooning and like, oh, he's the best. I wish he was my president. And I'm like, you, do you realize how many people are dying in New York, right? I mean, this has somehow been totally separated from him in like, you know, Donald, if Donald Trump is the mayor of New York, I think we probably have a rather different impression of it. Like everything that we've known about this, of course it's an evolving situation, but I can give you chapter and verse on the health commissioner of, of New York City, the mayor of New York City, and the governor of New York saying up until fucking March that we should go out and make sure you're not being racist to Chinese people. You know, get one of those ducks hanging in the window, like everything's gonna be fine. The Blasio and went on the train. He went on the train. He was in the gym. Gym, yeah. He yeah. has his car everywhere. He also still looks like shit, and he's always at the gym, and he's, he's always getting in trouble at the gym. Why he's always droopy? I don't understand <laughs> it. It doesn't he's, make sense. He's awful, and like he's they all these people have been wrong about this, and it's totally understandable. We knew nothing about this as it was happening. I think overreaction was was probably the most appropriate thing to do. At this point, it's now wrong. I think in, in a lot of but, ways. Because one thing that people are not asking the question of, we're talking about numbers, let's get good data. Incredibly important to have a, a, a numerator without a denominator. We didn't have a denominator for long. No sense of how many people were infected. So if you don't know how many people are infected, you don't know what the death rate is, right? So that's important. But the one thing that we can't figure out and no one is talking about is transmission and transmissibility. Like how is this being transmitted? Because we have a number of studies coming from different countries that suggests that you can't get it from a door handle. And we have no evidence that that is actually, in effect, that it exists on a door handle. And again, I'm not a scientist, so that being, being said, that the RNA that you can find on a door handle, it kind of, its strength dissipates pretty quickly. And it might be there, but it might not have an effect and, and infect you. So we don't know. There's an incredible study, interesting one, about the, the one town in Germany that was hardest hit. And these guys from the University of Bonn went in there, two guys, really interesting guys. And they went in there and they did this long study. And it turned out all of the transmission was from one super spreader salt. event. Was it, was it the salt shaker? It was, it was, it was some German uh, party. I don't know. It was, like, uh, it was like carnival or something. When they're so, all like kissing each other and being like anti-Semitic. So, so, the, so the article in ProPublica, I'm going to send it to you so that yeah. we get off. Um, it, it basically makes the point, and, and I had been making this point, you know, ad nauseum, that yes, at first, every, everybody, I mean, everybody is on record saying we don't have much to worry about here. Fauci. Yes. Yeah, you know, that's right. But somewhere around the beginning of March, that was no longer plausible. And somewhere that's around right. the beginning of the March, uh, the, the scientists and doctors within the city of New York were telling the mayor, uh, 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 we have a big problem here. And places like Ohio were shutting down. And the mayor of San Francisco, I, I've been reading about this woman, London Breed today. Yes, yes. Incredibly impressive biography. She she grew up in a housing project. Her She's very interesting, older, yeah. All the brothers yeah. in prison and her younger sister was something else. And she went on to get a master's degree in political science from UC uh, something. So, I mean, and she just had a tremendous amount of good common sense, essentially uh, planned for the worst and let the best take care of itself. But in New York, and, and this is an important point, I think, it's not just measuring from the calendar date. 
that we were so much later than San Francisco was. We were also further into our curve than they were. Mm -hmm. So it's not, it's not, you can't just line up the dates. You have to line up the curves. They had 10 cases we already had in the hundreds. So, and they just didn't do anything. And I was having arguments with my school board. But anyway, um, this article is pretty devastating. But you said that Dr. Katz gave an explanation. And I would, I would like to mm. know that because I'll read the email because I was furious when I read this email. And if, and if it's not fair to him, I would like to know that. It says, um, as Mayor Bill de Blasio, this is from the New York Times, as Mayor Bill de Blasio was resisting calls in March to cancel large gatherings and slow the spread of the coronavirus in New York City, he found behind the scenes support from a trusted voice, the head of his public hospital system, Dr. Mitchell Katz. There was, quote- Oh, that's a different Katz. Oh, it's a different Katz? Yeah, Mitchell Katz. Uh, David Katz is a guy from Yale and he, he's no longer at Yale, but he, he's an epidemiologist from Yale and he was the president of one of the hospitals. And he wrote a piece for the New York Times um, which he said was unfair in, in some sense, because, you know, ah. us writers don't write headlines ever, and we always get blamed for them. But the headline was, the cure is the cure worse than the disease. And of course, Trump starts uh, citing this. David Katz is such a le I went to his uh, house, we shot with him in, in Connecticut, and I, he is such a lefty. <laughs> you just wrote a book with Mark Bittman from the New York Times. And it was like, literally, there were like posters of like Mao. And he, was like, <laughs> and he was like, I'm not like a Trumpian guy, but I was just like, I don't know why they put this headline on it. But he was the one saying, we're not, we're making very radical decisions based on very little data and doing it with some level of assurance. Like, no, no, this is what we should do and it's like how bad is this going to be and what should we like his idea which i think was the right one and he was early to this was that we have to isolate and protect the most vulnerable pop populations because we had data coming particularly from italy and i think in england i saw a number the other day was it 72 percent of the deaths have happened in like old folks homes yeah yes. elder care facilities yeah. like almost three quarters of them i mean this is what you do the ring around and then you try to prevent that because Children, I mean, you're talking about like, we're starting to understand more and more, which is a lot we don't forget, about kids. And like kids, it's not clear at all that kids can actually spread it to parents. We don't know well, that. That's what, that's what uh, Alex Berenson said. He that said he's, I he think might be right about that. Yeah. yeah, he might be right about that. But it's like, you know, parents bring the kids and they're not, like this idea of kids as these little super spreaders hasn't really uh, like borne any fruit. So we don't know. But the thing is, is you know, Sweden, Denmark, uh, I think Austria now, and I know that even France, they're opening schools up. And, and I have well, a sense right? now that um, that we not might not have schools open. So I've been talking, um, I talked to my daughter about this, she's nine, that she's going to school and she knows this in September in Ireland, because her mom is an Irish, pa mom has an EU passport and grew up in Ireland. Um, and she's gonna go to school there because I, she's not gonna, I'm not fucking paying $16,000 to homeschool my ch children, you know, which is my child, which is what I do. Well, why why does it cost $16,000 right. to homeschool? It's a private school and they have the, these friggin' Zoom classes that you essentially have to do all the heavy lifting. Okay. It's so, like so, a morning meeting and that's it, so. We should talk about homeschooling too because I, cause I'm homeschooling too and I have, a, I have a lot of thoughts about that. So, so then good, I'm happy it's not the same cats. I don't wanna let, I'm happy yeah, 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 I yeah. have to let them off the hook. So about old people, yeah. So that puts in context that um, Governor Cuomo refused to let nursing homes turn away people with COVID. Thousands of people died. And here's the email that was in the Times. Um, there was, quote, no proof. This is the doctor tells, tells de Blasio, no proof that closures will help stop the spread. Dr. Katz wrote in an email to the, uh, to the mayor's closest aides. He believed that banning large events would hurt the economy and so fear, quote, if it is not safe to go to a conference, why is it safe to go to the hospital or ride the subway, he wrote. But then the, here's the key part. This is what he said, behind, this, is what, this is what they said behind the scenes. We have to accept that unless a vaccine is developed, large numbers of people will get infected, he wrote. The good thing is that greater than 99% will recover without harm. Once people recover, they will have immunity and immunity will protect the herd. So he was advocating for the full Sweden, essentially. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. While nobody told us that. Well, well, nobody told us exactly what you were saying that, okay, we're going to go to full Sweden. So you have to decide for yourself where you lay on this risk curve. And if you're yeah. old, if you have preexisting conditions, this is what you should do because we're going to try to shunt this all to the young, robust people. To say, and they didn't say that at all. They were telling us, no, you have nothing to worry about. And thousands died. 
And then they followed that up with a series of like catastrophically stupid decisions and ones that made no sense. I mean, closing parks. Um, a friend of mine was in New Jersey and saying they closed this park by his house, which is like an outdoor trail. It's like, I mean, are you kidding me? Literally no coronavirus is being spread in situations like this. If we knew, and by the way, this is, I mean, we have to disabuse people of these most basic things. Like you walk Harry by Ariel, that means convince them it's not true. Go ahead, go ahead. <laughs> yeah. You walk by, I see people walking by each other and like pulling masks up and walking to the side. It's like, that's not, that's not how it happens. And if that were how it happened, everybody would have coronavirus. If you could walk into a mist of coronavirus and come out the other and totally infected, is that what we've done now is gone the other direction of saying like, go to Chinatown. If you don't, you're an insane racist. But yeah. in doing, from doing that, of like lick the railings on Canal Street to this other end of like, don't go outside. It's, you're gonna die. What, what is, what is the, as far as we know, what is the most likely mode of transmission? Well, I mean, there's, I, you know, again, I, I'm not, <laughs> I'm not a professional in this at all. The stuff that I've been reading about are these things like super spreader events and pretty closed. Uh, so there's, a, there's an interesting study in South Korea of, um, it seems like talking a lot, by the way, is what does it, which is why we've had no massive outbreaks on planes, because there's not a lot of talking on planes. It's very rare that this happens in solitary activity. But there was an incredible thing, a study of half of an office in South Korea, you can see this visual, where one half was doing like call center stuff and it was completely, somebody had, was, was infected and it was completely across the board. They were all on like the other side, nothing. Because they're, you know, like expectorating and they're yelling and it's coming out and it's just sort of swirling around. And that kind of stuff seems to be like this German event where it seemed to be the real super spreader event. It's like people are kissing each other. They're like drinking on the same glasses and all this stuff. Whereas <laughs> walking around is not, is not giving people coronavirus. Are as there as, certain I mean, languages are there certain languages, I wonder, that German. are more prone to yeah. spread? Yiddish. <laughs> Yiddish is probably high on the list. But Very I, heavily hit in my neighborhood of South Brooklyn. Not a coincidence. But I, no, I, Israelis I, have a low rate of this. Well, maybe. The secular. I, because I have, I mean, certainly, I think certain, at the very least, certain sounds are more likely to release. I think that's probably oh, true. So if you're, if you, don't wait. Can I, just, can I just say what I think the, one, the worst thing that Trump actually has done that makes me curious? So we hit about something interesting and, and as yet undiscussed, but go ahead. <laughs> no, no, I, I, this, was, this was what I wanted to get to when I first started this chain is that the one thing that I think is really unforgivable, like really makes me furious is that he is pretending to support the lockdown policies of Fauci and whatever it is. And then he goes on and tweets gasoline to encourage people to defy their government and their government's policies and their lockdowns. To encourage Michigan. This is fucking outrageous. If you're the president and you don't agree with the lockdowns, fine, you're the president. Tell us you don't agree with the lockdowns. You know, you can make some calls. Unfortunately, you're the president. But, you, but to, to um, sow this kind of um, discord or, or whatever the, you know, disobedience, civil, he's sowing civ civil disobedience while he's pretending that he supports the policy is just beneath the office, it's despicable. Anybody mm. disagree with that? Has, has he ever not been despicable? I mean, it, it's, it's yeah, just- so, Sometimes, well, like when he, when he said out loud, I wonder if you could use the bleach, and I'm like, you know what? Yeah, I, I could see why he would off the top of his head say something, and then it made so much of it. And I was sure. like, whatever. But, sure, but no, no, you just, you just said, you know, tweeting that out is beneath the office. Is not disseminating false information and, and thinking off the top of his head beneath the office as well? I think that's why so many people have a hard on for Cuomo, even though he was so far behind and spread lies with de Blasio because he speaks in a paternal mode of the I think the that's way absolutely talks. right. It's yeah, a it's good bedside manner. Making I, up for us and people need that. Trump has an yeah. opportunity now to bring the country together if he just exhibited an ounce of emotion and empathy and he's yeah. not doing that and it's driving the country it's driving a massive divide in the country. That's why people love Cuomo because he's he's passionate and well, he he's I, Dang, he's taking up for us when in reality, he's just covering his ass because he fucked up. Well, I agree with you. And I, I said that people think Cuomo is Captain Kirk, but he's really William Shatner. Which is like a, a buffoon. 
Um, I mean, he's getting, I mean, but uh, yeah, I mean, yes, you can put that all in the same category with Trump. But what I'm saying is that quite often, I think people are overreacting to just kind of like this everyday guy kind of having, saying something off the top of his head and people react like it, the walls are going to come down. But this actually is consequential. I mean, he, he is sowing civil disobedience and you don't know where that's going to lead. And it's just, it's astounding to me. And, well, that, that's yeah. the craziest part. You look at these rallies and everyone has don't tread on me flags. And they're talking about, you know, their second amendment, right. And then the flag next to it is make America, keep America great. Trump 2020. It's like, he's part of the government. Like how it's, it's only causing a rift where he can distance himself from the governing bodies. And, and make, I'll say something to, to your point, and I'm sorry to interrupt you. It's, it's, it's tough on zoom to your point. I was just telling somebody earlier today, Trump was handed a huge opportunity here with this virus. I mean, totally. He had, it, this is the first time in my lifetime or any time I know of where a leader in a crisis didn't get a bump in, his, in the polls. If he had just appeared yeah. human and caring, nobody blames him for the virus. He nobody blames him for the deaths. He would, I, I bet people on the left would go, yeah, you know what? He's doing a good yeah. job. Instead, they're trying, to figure out, they're trying to figure out how can we undermine Biden in order to win. You didn't need that now. You have the yeah. coronavirus. You could have, you could have rid that, ridden that right into a landslide just by being a mensch. But he, he always needs a foil. Uh, you never, he didn't need that in the beginning. I mean, it's an incredible thing about the, the Russia stuff is that, you know, for all the ridiculous overreaction, which became that he's a Kremlin plant, is that the most basic component of that is that you really don't need a special amount of, uh, you know, sort of Russian, Ukraine information to dislodge the candidacy of Joe Biden, which he's quite capable of doing by himself when he opens his mouth. Yeah. So they're, they're, they do this incredibly stupid things all, all the time. And, you know, Ian said this absolutely right. There are people on the left that are desperate, and there used to be a joke about it in the first kind of year of his, his presidency, to say, okay, now he's becoming presidential, like Van Jones famously said yeah. this on CNN, he's like, this is his presidential moment. I'm like, don't be so sure about it because somebody who's that schizophrenic might hit it once in a while. But most of the time, it's just the needles going <laughs> like this. And he's too, like, the, the impulsiveness is kind of okay in, you know, an economy that has roaring and has the sort of like lowest unemployment in a very long time. Who cares? Because the argument from Trump people, and it's not even Trump people, it's people that are like, you know, the guy's a buffoon, but you know, let's, let's calm down. The argument is basically this. We give too much kind of, we valorize the office too much. Like, oh, mm -hmm. they're so presidential, but they do horrible things, right? They can be so presidential and say it's so nice. And then, you know, waterboard people in their basements and like, yes, but he said it in this wonderful way. So who gives a shit how Trump says it as long as he's not making it worse? It's no foreign wars. He lobs 75 cruise missiles, Tomahawk missiles into Syria. That's it. Says a couple things about, about um, Afghanistan because someone showed him pictures, by the way, of like women in pants in the 1970s. He's very, very easily swayed by images. It's incredible. So he was like, oh yeah, let's get back to the pants era. <laughs> that was great. And let's send troops in. But other than that, it's just kind of trundling along. He's making a complete asshole of himself all the time, but it's inconsequential. Right. You know, the larger kind of scheme of things. But no one is right in this sense. And, and like this, when this happens and you are at the beginning, it's like, at first I'm like, these guys are being unfair to him. He didn't say it was a hoax. He said the reaction that the media is saying that he did is a hoax, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. He didn't say it was a hoax, fine. But at the same time, he is actually coming out and it's, it's so crazy. It's like maybe 200,000 people are gonna die. This is gonna, I mean, he is, was his numbers were higher than the experts at the time. I mean, he's going back and forth and back and forth. And, you know, at times he's kind of right. The UV light thing in the, when he was talking about drinking the bleach, there was a UV light thing. That's actually, there was actually someone doing something. Like he hears little snatches of conversation and he repeats them. He doesn't give a shit what comes out. But when it comes to this point in policy and the economy is crippled, I mean, this is unprecedented. And it is something there is no economic response to. There's no economic policy that can fix this. 2008, there were structural problems within the economy, right? And you can do whatever, you can you know, have all sorts of things, which, which the Obama administration does, and you know, a lot of them I very much disagree with, but they do a bunch of policy responses, right? Because that's what you have to do. But this is no, it's, the economy didn't do anything here. This is the government saying, it's a virus. So we have to solve the virus first. And every minute he is fucking this up and making this longer and more difficult, the more pain Americans are feeling 
from, from the economy bottoming out. And I'm very, very annoyed with people, and this is the final thing, of these blue checkmark people on Twitter talking about, you know, they go outside and they, they, they're, 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 they're uh, flouting the regulation stuff. It's like, you know what? They don't fucking live in Manhattan and they're not still getting paid. Like, I get paid. I mean, like, I'm still getting a salary. I took a pay cut, but I'm getting a salary. And so I'm okay. I can actually ride this out. Friends of mine ride this out, but most people can't. And like, I met a woman shooting this piece who was like a cleaner and she's like, I, I have no work now. I can't, nothing to clean. All the offices are closed. What does she do? $1,200 check. Yeah, great. And then you have these jerk offs on Twitter telling her, you know, don't, don't say that you want to go out and work again. It's like, look, the woman knows her risk profile and says, yeah, I kind of want to get back to work because it is death for me in a different way if I don't. And so I just think it's like, at this point, we're having a fake conversation that has become increasingly stupid and partisan. And I have no idea why being sort of, let's open the economy a bit more is considered like a right wing thing. And let's never open the economy is considered a left wing thing. I, I don't understand it. It's, it's, totally, it's totally insane. And to your point of, you know, these blue check marks saying you can't leave your house. It's like insane that the left has championed pro-choice for so long. And then now they're like, all lives matter. No one can die. Nobody yes. can die. And, and this, it's, this isn't going away. It's, it's no. never going to go away. So we have to, you know, do that kind of actuarial table and see it sucks, but that's what you do. I mean, you have to look at who's, who's most I mean, I mean the, the left has, has turned into the right. And the amount, the lack of empathy for someone like a cleaner that, that has to go to work, $1,200 pays half their rent in New York City. They have to feed their kids. Also, my heart breaks for people who have five kids. They were in a miserable marriage. They're stuck with their kids. They have to homeschool. The work was an escape for them. Driving to work was the alone time that they needed to reset their mind, to deal with the family that they resent. And now they're with their family all the time. Yeah. And it's a complete fucking nightmare. Starting and to figure out how we can open this economy, which is not a conversation, it's a public conversation. Does anybody know what phase one, phase two, phase three looks like in New York City? It's not a conversation we're having. No. But that conversation is a left-wing conversation. Because who is hurt by this most? The working class. That's it. I mean, it's not, I mean, this would be something like, look, Bernie Sanders in the past, he changed his, he changed his mind on this because he was trying to become president in a particularly woke progressive time. But he was really, really anti-immigration before because he was like, hey, you know, I like immigrants, fine, but, you know, immigrants depress working class wages. And so therefore, because they take jobs away from the working class, et cetera, it was a pretty common argument that was made. And like, so it strikes me, this is one of those other things that strikes me that people on the left should be very, very, um, active in making this argument saying like not we shouldn't just open things up and people die but it's like we're, we insulted the governor of Georgia and the governor of, uh, of Florida um, Kemp and uh, DeSantis saying this is going to be a bloodbath didn't happen I mean can, can we get an apology or try to figure out why it didn't happen or are we so wrapped up in politics that we're like you know what well f fine you know, let's figure let's okay but what about it's like the what about -ism is like, let's just change the subject to something else. I mean, Sweden, people make these charts. Sweden's up here, Norway's down here, Finland's. Yes, but Sweden is considerably fewer deaths than the UK, Belgium, France, Italy, and Spain, right? And the Netherlands, I think, too. So what is going on? Can we have an honest conversation about this without getting mired in politics? Now, when do we ever have an honest conversation about anything in this country Never. without it becoming political? <laughs> You, you, want a, you want an honest conversation? Don't go to don't go to relationship counseling. So listen, I I um I uh, I disagree with one. I sort of disagree with one thing you said, although you probably won't disagree with me. It's not clear to me that the working class is the hardest hit here. If they unless those jobs never come back because they're getting eleven hundred dollars a week. The entrepreneurial class, which I'm a member of, mm -hmm. um, we're getting. Although I'm not crying poverty but I can put myself in a situation I was 10 years ago when I basically one, one snowstorm could was, was threatening to my existence. Um, we have fixed costs yeah. that are not going away. I mean, I'm every, my costs are, I don't know, 30, $40,000 a month per business mm -hmm. that, and, and that is not, and that's without have no payroll. It's just rent insurance, uh, utilities, all this stuff that doesn't really go away. 
and business owners are getting destroyed. Destroyed. Mom and pops destroyed. Yeah. Wor worse than the working class, I think. Worse than the working class. Well, I mean, a sheer dollar number, I would say that that's absolutely right. And it's not to in any way take away from the fact that, you know, I talked to a guy in the in the East Village who was opening. No, I mean, existentially, was, existentially. Oh, yeah, no, no, of course. Yeah, yeah, no, that you might not exist or you're going to exist in a radically different way, particularly, you know, Comedy Cellar, that, that room at McDo is not a big room, you know? I mean, it's like, how do you do that? That's, and that's, of course, in these, all these other opening up scenarios, the last thing that you open up, right? That's, right. that's the absolute last. And so, yeah, no, no, in no way do I, uh, you know, underplay or undercount that. It's just in sheer numbers, it mm -hmm. is people, you know, working class people that, yeah, no, we're giving them unemployment benefits, we're giving them uh, stimulus uh, money, well, whatever you want to call it, bailout money, it's not stimulus money. Yeah, um, yeah. But what does that do to the economy? This is not something in economics that you discover the next day. No. I mean, you keep printing money, and what is oh, the inflationary well, effect of that? Who knows? Me, we'll see. Well, I mean, it seems to me, if, if as long as all the essential things are being done, things that we can't live without, food is being produced, uh, heat and heating oil is being delivered, and this and that, and uh, every, anything we can't live without is being taken care of, then it's just a matter of distributing everything in a way that, that, that nobody is, you know, is... Uh, well, we haven't had any breakdowns in, 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 in that, which has been really su surprising and pretty actually interesting that how robust those networks are of getting food to like, yeah, yeah, you know, your, your grocery store doesn't have a lot of stuff on the shelf, but that's not because of these distribution networks falling down. It's just because of panic buying. By the way, we should say that the people who really get hit the hardest, even worse, is, are the essential workers. I mean, the people yes, who are out there. that's yeah. absolutely true. Awful. I mean, but th there, was a, there was something I saw the other day, and I don't want to quote this without a huge caveat, that I think it was, it was either doctors or nurses in New York City had a lower rate by a pretty significant amount of, of uh, the disease because of things like you know the PPP that they wear and they're pretty close uh, involved with people but you know it's it's actually uh, been been okay I mean the one thing that that no one's going back and talking about the things like you know the USS USS Comfort Javits Center setting yeah. up triage places in Central you. Park you know what 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 about I mean the ventilators all this stuff I'm happy that we overplayed this because I'm happy that we had that capacity. But I think that it's creating an incredible amount of skepticism with people that I know are like, why did they never talk about this ever again? They just kind of were pushed they, it away. Were they, do you yeah. find that, would you find it? Well, I, I was just gonna ask, was not the point of the lockdown and putting a pause on everything to take the stress off the, the hospital hospitals. system yeah. so that they could deal with the amount of skyrocketing cases? Now yes. that the healthcare system has leveled out and we're at a place where we can breathe, why are we not taking massive precautionary steps to now integrate us back into society? Why is everything being shut and extended when the hospital system is very much at a place that can take care of any situation that comes its way? Well, yeah, it's yeah, it's a good question. I mean, the paranoia is the hardest thing now. Well, I, okay, this is what I think. First of all, Noam has addressed this several times. While everybody's getting, if, if they, if if everybody wasn't getting their eleven hundred dollars a week, you would see even three times the pressure. I what mean, is this $1,100 a week you speak of? Uh, well, people, maybe you don't get it because you're an independent contractor, but like everyone who, everyone, all salaried employees are getting approximately $1,100 a week. Yeah, uh, I'm not. I, I mean, I'm getting a good amount, but it, it, it yeah. ain't $1,100. It's, you're, 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 in a, you're in a different spot. And that's why you're maybe more eager. But listen, this is what I think. When you have no choice, um, the option, the choice is easy. And to me, I still haven't heard anything other than what I'm about to say. The only thing we can do is ask every single person to wear a mask, go back to work, and then we can wait a week or two and see how it plays out. And if it plays out, then we have to, there, we, there is nothing else. There's no therapies, those didn't pan out. There's no, there is nothing. There's masks and responsible behavior. And that's the way it's gonna be a month from now, two months from now. So they, sh I think they should just, and I know that people, it's ridiculous outside, but for the reason of keeping it easy to police, because we don't want is the cops saying, oh, you guys, uh, you're, you're fewer than six feet apart. Okay, sorry, officer, we get right. And then the cop walks away and they, then they, they get right back together again. And the cops pulling out tape measures and all that. I yeah. think everybody, everybody should be wearing a mask for a few weeks. 
Let's see how it works. If that's workable, start, start letting out, reducing, maybe reducing it outside, whatever it is. Trial and error until we find what works. Because what else is there? What are we waiting for here? The right. And look, you're going to have little, you know, explosions of cases. It's going to happen. Exactly. And you cannot and shut down and say, oh my God, South Korea, they did such a good job and they opened up and they're having, little, it's like, yeah, yeah, no, that's going to happen. Exactly. What matters is how many people are hospitalized and how many people are yes. dying and things like that. Yes. They've seen so. so many science fiction movies where they come up with the high tech solution right at the end. <laughs> I really think that that's part of it. Like we thought this is Dr. McCoy is going to get the vaccine and well, it's not coming. And, and you know what, this contact tracing is not going to be the be all end all. No, nothing is going to solve it except there's one thing. It's, it's, it's kind of a low tech issue. And the low tech issue is that we need, we need, you still there, Michael? He's dancing around his apartment. I think he's doing a TikTok video. Nah. Where, what happened he to him? He ran off somewhere, but you can continue. No, because you know, I, I want him to hear. In, in I think he's still got his headsets on. He can hear you. Oh, he I think he had to turn lights on. Rise anyway. Yeah, yeah. Right, I, come, I was burning something in the oven, too. So. I was going to say that. I Cauliflower think, is like literally on fire. So. He, when, he, when you put on a tighter shirt. When you take, <laughs> when you take your mind off all the, the tech stuff, we have a low tech, as a friend of mine called, analog problem, which is we need a barrier between your droplets and me. And we can do that by having a certain number of feet between us or by some kind of barrier that we already know about and by refining that through clever people, again, trial and error, maybe optimizing masks in some way, which we have yet to do, but it's, it's a low tech solution. I, but no, how do you do that in the comedy club, which is not only packed together, but people are Laughing, guffawing, that's just and like Ian, the worst possible. Yeah. Well, a book Ian. <laughs> <laughs> book the most expendable comedians first. <laughs> no, we don't get many guffaw. People, people, people chuckle when Ian's on, but we don't. We yeah, know. Yeah, uh, yeah. Listen to the number one album on iTunes and you will hear an incredible response. Now look, maybe comedy clubs don't open or every other table and, you, and only young people come. I'm really not speaking from my own uh, for my own interests here, I, if, if, they, if they let everybody open but me, I would say the same thing, which is that for most situations here, there's, I don't know what they're waiting for. It's, it's, nothing's gonna change a month from now, but, and we don't know that masks will work, but if, did you see that article about Flushing Queens, which is right next to Corona Queens, and yeah. Flushing Queens has almost no cases and Corona yeah. is just teeming with it? Mm -hmm. It's a pretty strong indication that masks and, and responsible behavior are the answer. And so do you, do you genetically superior, you know, uh, bring back the guardian <laughs> angels. Cops aren't meant to keep people yeah. away. Bring yeah, back I, want, you, you know, I want Curtis Sliwa to be going yeah. around, you know, enforcing yeah. health policy. Put on policy. a fucking mask. <laughs> and, 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 everybody, and everybody rightfully derides Trump for, for making his speeches without wearing a mask. But then Cuomo does the same thing and nobody yeah. says yeah. fool about it. What yeah. the fuck is that? Um, but no, do, will you, do you imagine something with the seller? Like, I mean, the great thing that you did after all of these fucking annoying people when Louie comes on, they're like, I didn't know. It was like being mugged and you're like, you get, okay, I'll pay for your drinks, you can leave. It's now it's on the ticket. Are you, do, are you gonna have to do something like that that says, okay, come in, sign the thing and say, I'm gonna take the risk because it's a small space and blah, blah, blah. I mean, is that something that will get you towards opening again? Yeah, well, we, we have a certain advantage there because we have, um, uh, some underutilized spaces above the, the Olive Tree restaurant above the Comedy Cellar. It really just exists as a hangout. It's not a money making thing. So we could actually do shows there too. And I already actually have that in the works. So if we only had half capacity downstairs and the other half is upstairs, if people want to come, then we could get, we could approach full capacity. And the same thing around the corner, the Village Underground location, we have a main bar area there, which is yeah. the hangout at. And we could do shows there. And, and and both those can be credible shows with real lighting. You know, we can set the, they're, they're good rooms. But my question is, will people come? No, yeah, I think if you start right now. St yeah. stuffing a release under their nose saying, if I get Corona, <laughs> you know, that doesn't create a great environment or atmosphere um, for, for a comedy show. And I also think that if everybody's wearing a mask inside the comedy club, I think that might incline people to say, you know, we'll just wait a few more weeks and, and, and see a and, show again. No, but I'm saying everybody needs to wear masks. If they, they want public right now, everybody's got to wear a mask. I'm, I'm just, just do it. But no, yeah, but how are you saying at a comedy club? I don't know that 
that would create an environment that would be conducive. How do you eat chicken wings with a mask? How do you t drink your drink with a mask at a comedy show? And what about the biohazard, just all the waste of people throwing out gloves and masks everywhere? That in and of itself is going to be a complete nightmare. Well, I don't, one, uh, it's a, uh, how do you eat? You probably, maybe we can't serve food. Drinks, I suppose you could put a, a straw under your thing, but maybe, but maybe there's no drinks. I don't know. I don't know. I mean, my, my perfect world here is that people understand the risks and they understand if they don't have any pre-existing pre conditions that are comorbidities and they're young, just fucking go out and just get, just, you know, build the herd immunity if you have to. Like, we don't know if, if that confers immunity, if you actually get it. We, other viruses it, that's obviously. That's a big are, problem though, isn't it? Big problem, we don't know. That's, that's a huge, huge caveat to this whole thing. We don't know if you can get it again. The I likelihood, I think, according to the research, is it is you cannot, at least for some period of time, it confers some immunity, at least according to what I've read. And that's generally and that story of secondary cases in South Korea turned out to be wrong. Yeah, I and said that also, too. And also, it seems that certain blood types produce antibodies and certain blood types do not produce antibodies. So you could have had it and not have any, and test negative for antibodies. And it also, it hates men too, this virus. It's very misandrist, I think is the And word. low T. It's very you sexist. Low T. Men with low T are at risk. Oh. Low T cell count, you mean? Yeah, low, low testosterone. testosterone. Low testosterone. I've also really? read that they think- No, I mean, you gotta stay inside for like five more months, buddy. I've also <laughs> read that maybe, um, maybe smokers might actually be protected. Yeah, that's right. Woody Allen was right. They found that in France, yes. <laughs> exactly. I'm going out, I'm living my best life. I, no mask life for me, baby. Let's do it. Now, by I the way, <laughs> My employees will not want to come back to work if they're making eleven $1 hundred dollars uh, at home, and I don't blame them. Absolutely now, right. We've seen that already. To, are you going to have to cut comics pay? Well, we talked. Yeah, we've talked about that. He'll try not to. Well, I said that. Yeah. <laughs> road road gigs. Yeah. You gotta you gotta map out. Is if I'm going to lose money on the flight. And then if they're pay, cutting my pay in half, how are you going to get a bonus if they cut the 300 seat th place to a 100, you know? It's, I mean, you guys are totally right about young people going out. You wear a mask, but you take the risk and you look at the fact that it's statistically, it, it, there are some cases that are, are you die and, and that really sucks. But I think a slow integration is the way to go, but you don't go out without a mask and, you know, just eat the first ass that you see. I think you're not going out and you're having random. Is that an up. expression? <laughs> yeah, it's uh, it's more of a mantra I live by. But I think uh, I think the answer it's it's a. But here's the thing, I could get crucified for saying that right now. Of course, you know? yes. And, don't and say that on Twitter. Mm -mm, that's insane don't. to me. Yeah, because it's a thing of like we can say whatever we want but the own citizens shame you to a fact where you can't say certain things publicly. It's crazy. The, well, the I best... think if you say, if, if you're, if, I don't think anyone's gonna crucify you for saying maybe we should consider opening up in a safe way with masks and with people that have no comorbidities. I see it, I see it already. You know, I ride my bike everywhere and I see these coffee shops, restaurants, bars, they all have a table at the door you wait in line, mm. you go up, you order. People are drinking outside of bars. They walk mm. together in groups. People are getting takeout. I think that's the slow open that's happening. And it's then happening we anyway. To, yeah. we just, it's yeah. happening anyway, whether or not people are saying to do it or not. Well, I and think people just have to look at the numbers. Like you said, Michael, it, it's blips are gonna happen, but look at the amount of hospitalizations and, and deaths among those numbers. Yeah. I mean, the, the thing that a listener to the podcast, they do the, the fifth column, they uh, sent uh, an email because I was uh, talking about the number of people that have yelled at me. And I've seen yelling at other people. And he coined the term uh, uh, social distance warriors. The people that like if you're like I was in the park and I was with some people and my, my daughter and one of her friends from school and this woman and we were talking oh, masks on. We're all talking. And this woman was like, I can't. This is amazing. And she's like muttering to her friend and walks by. And I'm like, 
how the fuck do you know that we haven't all had an antibody test? We haven't all had it. We don't all live together in some like Mormon, like madness. And, you know, people are doing this all the time. What it has done, and this is the, I guess the thing that I can't say because people get mad at me, is that this is given, and I hate to be political, but this is given self-righteous like Brooklyn liberals, something else to be self-righteous about. And it's so frustrating because I'm like, stop be, like shaming random people for not doing what you, and they're always wrong. They don't like, they have no sense of the epidemiology of this, but they're like, oh my God, you are standing too close to that person. I'm like, they're not, that's not how it transmits. So you stop, better preach, Michael Moynihan. Stop virtue signaling for everyone in your fucking neighborhood and saying like, and this is everywhere. Oh, I, I don't know like, if they're necessarily virtue signaling. Some of them are scared. I mean, it, it could yeah. be virtually sig signaling is a factor, but it's also a factor when I see some somebody without a mask getting close to me, I feel like- Also true, yeah, something. there are people that do that too, yeah. We're running out of time so fast. Can we get on, can we go and talk about homeschooling? Oh God. Briefly. So, yeah. so this has been my observation on home. So you are, you, you are homeschooling your daughter now, correct? Um, well, you know, I'm homeschooling her with the assistance of the school that I pay for, but I get to hear the morning Zoom call and then some interaction Zoom calls and I'm like, wait, I'm paying for this? And there's one, and I, I shouldn't say this publicly, but one that happened the other day, when they were talking about a book that she was reading, she's nine years old, and said like, you know, what, what, <laughs> what were the uh, genders of the people involved? I swear to God, I and my daughter was like, I was like a man and a woman, a boy and a girl. And he's like, yes, they both identified yeah. as a man and a woman. And I'm like, dude, she's nine. Like that's, she's like, what? Can you just keep going? So in some sense, the homeschooling, I'm like, oh, maybe I can straighten her out again. <laughs> here's, my fee here's my feeling about homeschooling is um, if it's only gonna be another few months, who cares? What, are they gonna learn something so incredible in those few months, I can't live without it? Uh, how much do you, learn, do you use anyway what you learn in school? <laughs> it's not about what they learn, it's just about how much of a pain in the ass it is when you're trying to like do anything, because your whole day is now with your kids. Uh, so so this, this is my observation of homeschool, and I always felt this way, but I've really seen it firsthand. I think that every educational innovation probably since 1945 has been a detriment to the kids. I, I, see, <laughs> I see the time in these fancy software presentations that it takes my kid to be, um, to, to be drilled on like 10 multiplication problems. I could give him 10 flashcards in 60 seconds, and it takes him this all rigmarole to do the same 10 problems 30 minutes in the way, in the way they present it. And everything they do is, they're so enamored with technology, everything they do makes it worse. If I just spent 20 minutes with my kid, 20 minutes reading, 20 minutes doing math facts, and I don't know what 20 minutes of practice writing, right? That's it, an hour a day, I'm yeah. convinced he would be, fully ahead of everybody in his class based on the way they're homeschooling. Uh, you know, I'm, we're going through the same thing, the way they're, the curriculum that they're asking us to follow from home. That's not a, that's not a, um, a commentary on homeschooling, it's a commentary on education in general. Well, but I'm saying it really brought hold of me. Now that, I, now that I see what they do all day, again, it feels like, what a waste of time. No wonder Abraham Lincoln <laughs> and everybody in his generation to go to one room schoolhouse and, and write and do math better than anybody today. Because they didn't, ha they, they didn't have the, the um, misfortune well, of whiteboards and all this stuff that everybody had to find a way to use. You're also talking okay. about extraordinary people like Abraham Lincoln uh, rather than uh, the many people of his generation. Our grandparents' generation. <laughs> My grandfather grandparents couldn't do math to save his asshole. Our grandparents' generation were wrote, spelled, did math, everything better than any. Oh, most of them were, most of them didn't write anything or do math with. <laughs> Dan, you have no faith in your own grandparents, do you? Oh, no. my, my grandparents, my grandpa, <laughs> your grandparents were pro-slavery. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. His <laughs> grandparents were just illiterate hicks, and he just applies that to everyone else. The problem is, is I never really talked to my grandfather. We had a distant relationship, but <laughs> I didn't get a, a very mathematical vibe from the guy. <laughs> you know a better way to learn your multiplication tables and flashcards written on a piece of paper? Okay, I mean, you know, no. I, I think it's repetition, but also at the same time, look at, Look at the, the numbers they've crunched on people working in an office eight hours a day, and then they find they only do how many hours of actual work, and you're just doing this busy time. That's the same thing with education. Kids get burnout. 
You only have a small window where they can learn. Everything else is a burden. And it's taken away creativity. It's taken away play. It's taken away what it means to actually be a, a, an organism in this world that we're living in. And it, it's totally a detriment to kids' imagination and their ability to feel value because if they don't get these things right in the time span, they have this inner monologue of like, oh, I'm wrong. Oh, I didn't get it right. Yeah, oh, this yeah. is bad. And it's not good. It, it's it has not been a, good. It has been an incredible experiment. Totally uh, like a, a social experiment. Our, and I know Noam loves him, our friend uh, John McWhorter, uh, tweeted the other day something I thought was true. Somebody said, oh, you know, you must be getting like writing and doing all this. And he's like, I have never had a less productive three months in my life than yeah. the last three months. Because there, it, when you strip everything away and you remove the environment entirely, all the kind of motivations and all those triggers during the day that tell you what to do, you're just sitting there and you're like, I don't, what do I do now? And like, oh, I have all this time. I should have written a novel by now. Well, it's also, like, I, I'm trying. I just finally called, I emailed my barber, Richie, and I was like, can you come give me a haircut? <laughs> I was like, that's the most I've accomplished. Michael, if I'm reading you correctly, in a good psychological yeah. frame of mind, you're probably not going to write that novel. No, I'm also mentally ill. So there's, yeah, well, there's a lot of factors. Ill, hey, Michael, high five. <laughs> If Michael, I'll ask you a question. Okay, confinement is certainly not going to help your mental health. No, it's not doing you know, it very like, well. Although some people actually have derived a benefit from it. Or so I yeah, think. yeah, no, that's true. That's true. Yeah, it's not well, across the board. Let me ask you a question. Oh, that was one of the things that this Mayor Katz said. Is, uh, Dr. Katz is that if, if uh, the mentally ill people were going to feel lost, that's the most thing, that's the thing we should worry about most. I want to ask you a question. These articles about- They always feel lost. These articles about- um, people getting so used to working from home that they'll, they won't want to go to work anymore. It sounds like you're skeptical of that based on the observations you just yeah, it's made. Ab it's absolute nonsense. I mean, I saw that, was it, uh, what's that dickhead from Twitter, Jack? Uh, what's his name, Jack? Jack guy. Said like, if you work at Twitter, you can work from home forever. You don't ever have to come back into the office. And I think that there's like, you know, people are like, ah, oh, it's amazing. But depending on a number of factors, like how many kids you have, where you live, how big your apartment is, it's kind of stultifying and kind of oppressive to like, and I went out to Long Island today and um, I was like, holy, wow, this open is green and it was so amazing because I've been sitting in this apartment for, and I actually am beating everybody because I um, wasn't going to the office for like a month and a half before this broke out and, and just for other reasons. And so I'm on like five months now and I just, I can't take it anymore. I mean, yeah. you need, particularly when you're doing, um, when you're like pitching stories, and I know it's obviously very different with comedy, but when you're pitching stories, like I, do, I can come up with the best idea for a story, for a, a premise, for a piece I'm gonna do, if I'm sitting with five people in a room and you're like, oh, well, what about that? And it just keeps going and building and building and you have these incredible, you know, it's like a writer's room. And at the end of this, like, I don't have that. Coming up with something by sitting down, like, okay, let's come up with an idea that doesn't really work. It can happen. You can get that thunderbolt that hits you, but it's not great. I mean, it's much, much better yeah. if you sit down with a bunch of people that you work with and you know bounce ideas off each other. And when you lose that, Zoom doesn't I, I, work. I agree with you. Look, let's be honest. Husbands can't wait to get the fuck out of the house to go to work. <laughs> well, no, no, I mean, and wives and too. Wives. Yeah, yeah, wives too. And, and um, so most of yeah, us- Yeah, wives too. Most yeah, of yeah. our social Get life. Get Juanita on the Zoom. Let's see what she says. I know, really. I'd love to hear her. All right, all right. Calm down. Most of yeah, our social it, life, it. most of our social lives revolves around work. Mm -hmm. If you just stay home all day and then afterwards you're still home and then you don't, you're not making, uh, you're not physically making friends and hanging out out. I mean, you would just, I can't imagine it working. It just, I mean, it's at a certain age, all of your friends come from work. Yeah, and you, yeah. you like uh, the, the ones from earlier just drift off and they move and they have kids. Yeah. But you always have that core ones you work with. And when you don't have an office, that's a especially, especially as, as comics, when you're going out at night and you're yeah. around all these people and you're pitching jokes, you're just hanging out, having a good time. Yeah. And even the fact of, to, I, I feel to be a good comic, you have to live a life. You have to go someplace. You have to go yeah. somewhere. You have to observe. You have to take things in. And if you're sitting at home, I was talking to somebody and they were like, yeah, I have 20 new minutes. It's like, of what? Nothing. <laughs> and also when you distill it down, it's probably like five, not even. Mm -hmm. So what are we doing? You know, three decent minutes. Yeah. 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 But going I will say, I, I, I'm sorry. I mean, it's not true. 
Just going to say, mean, go, go into the train, riding the train, riding in a car. These are things that are very important to people to function normally as a human, to get out of your space of being a century person just sitting there. You know, I, thank God I have my bicycle because I ride all over the city. It's very meditative for me. And now every Tom, Dick, and Harry in the books riding a city bike, and it drives me fucking insane. Well, I've been See, but that's good. A city bike for several years, so I prefer. I, I, it, love it. I do want to say, well, Michael. I, you know, say one thing quickly. That is good. What you're having, what's happening is good because the one kind of thing that motivates you as a person that you cannot get when you're sitting at home alone is is hatred. And yeah. I always choose my friends and people that I'm with as like these unified hates. We hate the same thing. Liking the same things is boring. Hating the same things is important. When you sit home by yourself and you don't hate anything, it's like no one's annoying you. No one's like, well, I go outside. Now I'm going out a lot more. And I'm like, I, oh my, like everyone's fucking horrible. And now my <laughs> life is more complete. Michael, that is a great observation about friendship. I, 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 really, I really like that. I'm going to repeat that. <laughs> um, I do want to say that there is one thing I... I hope stays. I don't ever want to have to go to any accountant or lawyer's office ever again, drag <laughs> me down, all that mess. There is no reason they can't Zoom with me. No yeah. reason whatsoever. But other than that, I don't see anything about staying uh, home. That, that's well, I bought, a, I bought a car because I was going crazy and I got to get out of here. And I bought it online. Didn't, and it's being delivered. And those things are great. Hopefully yeah. that, more of that. I don't have to deal with like, you know, so was that? Sight unseen. Sight unseen. I get seven days to return it. Is it Tesla? Uh, no, Carvana. Oh, which Tesla. is this? Which well, is Tesla this? Tesla does app. a lot of online sales. You know. That's yeah, they do. do. They do. But you know, Elon Musk is uh, destroying his own company's uh, the equity of everybody by tweeting. <laughs> is he mentally ill? Probably. There's something wrong with him. Yes. Yeah, for sure. But I yeah. kind of appreciate him in a way. Yeah. I like the fact that he exists. Mentally, yeah. yeah, it's awesome. <laughs> yeah, he's like, you know I, what I'm going to do? I'm going to sell all my houses. Like, awesome. I, I mean, you're proving what now? And he just sell, he's, he's put like eight houses on the market. That's I, I feel like at a certain point when you get to a level of like fame or something, you can't detach your brain from realizing that at, at one public thought, the world could massively hate you. And it really fucks with your head to a level that I don't think we could understand. Mm -hmm. And especially with the amount of wealth and power he has, that just me must be compounded on him so much. I, I read a piece about him that his ex-wife wrote about their divorce. He's a real piece of shit. Wow. He's his ex-wife wrote a piece about him? <laughs> An ex-wife yeah. said her husband or ex-husband was a piece of shit? Yeah, but I don't know, like you don't usually get paid by the word for it. You just say it and people go, wow. That's yeah, amazing. I mean, it's that. it's a juicy piece of hot goss. Maybe we it's can a hot goss. hating it, you know? <laughs> I got to see that. I, I think he might be bipolar, actually, actually yeah. bipolar. Did you see him on Rogan? No. Even before he smoked weed? Because he's no. famously, no, that's like become a meme of him, like, you know, blowing a huge cloud. It's because Rogan smoked rid of him. But he was clearly a little off um, in the whole interview. I mean, he's clearly incredibly bright. But I think at the end of this, the person to really watch is Bezos, because who could become the world's first trillionaire and is doing incredibly well off of this, is that unless he takes half of that money and just gives it away, yeah. then he is going to be the absolute winner and loser of this. He yeah. is going to be the hate figure of all hate figures, because yeah. Who do you hate? The the guy, the rich guy. Who do you really hate? The richest guy in the world. Now, who do you fucking really, really hate? The guy who became the richest guy in the world because everybody else was suffering. So at the end of this, Bezos, I mean, he like better start opening schools for like invalids and the blind, you know, as fast as he can. Yeah. Well, it reminds me, so Bloomberg just just reminds me of it. So I read that Bloomberg offered to donate ten million dollars for contact tracing. Did you, did you see that? Yeah, he, he spent, he spent almost a billion dollars, nine hundred and eighty million dollars in a shitty quixotic campaign. Nice yeah, one. Yeah, that's right. You, you yeah. can't get ten million dollars for anything anymore, dude. Like yeah. you're a fucking loser. And you got to offer thirty, forty million dollars. Otherwise, you just don't offer anything. Nobody's expecting it. But ten million dollars. The, the best thing, but I have to say, the best thing that ever happened from that Bloomberg thing was now I don't have to hear people anymore say you can just buy an election. It's like no, no, you can spend a bit, and you. But if you're shitty. You're yeah. not going to buy, like, I, if I started taking steroids, I'm not going to play in the major leagues. And I'm not going to hit, because I suck, I'm not going to hit home runs. Because I'm just taking, it's not, I have to be good at it. And Mike Bloomberg was so monumentally shitty at it that he spent a billion dollars in one American Samoa. 
right. What you a know, delegate. It's a in subject. American Samoa. Of, it's a subject. However, for if, you're, if you're if you're reasonably good at it. Hold on. I, I never understood why Citizens United uh, was such a controversial decision or why most people didn't realize it was obviously correct. I never got that because if you thought it was wrong, you thought that somebody should have been prosecuted for doing a documentary about Hillary Clinton during an election yes. season. How, how could that possibly that. be the right answer? To, if you have any friends that say, hear that and say, God, no, come on, you're becoming a right-wing troglodyte, send them to uh, Chris Novoselic, who was the bass player for Nirvana. Nirvana, um, yeah. Wrote an incredible piece that he really like, wrote this long piece about, from like a progressive Green Party perspective and why Citizens United was the right decision for people on the left too. And particularly, you know, it, 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 it helps labor unions and labor unions spend tons of money on elections and they kind of quiet about it because it was, it was very beneficial to them in the end too. Yeah, I mean, I'm, it literally would have allowed you to criminalize political speech. Yes. And the fear, the bugaboo was that you could buy elections, which you can't buy, but as we know now, but we knew it all along. The money- Yeah, Michael Huffington was the first example of that. Ariana's uh, gay husband who, who uh, spent the most ever in a uh, congressional seat and lost like by a huge margin, spent like an insane amount of money. The money, the, pour, the money pours into the candidate that people think is going to win. They do not, the, the, the money is not what makes them. When Biden was broke, didn't have a dime until he started winning. And then, he, then, the, then they started donating because they want the favors from the winner. That's why they donate. I think yeah. that if, you, if you're reasonably capable and you have the money, then you have a, uh, an even It greater. helps. Yeah, it, you need it, certain, it's not that it doesn't help. It helps, but it can't yeah, alone but, by But look at yeah. Bernie. Look at all the money he raised. It didn't help for shit. Yeah. There's a law of diminishing returns like in anything. You need a certain amount of money. And then above that, the other dollars don't get you much. But, but that, that money versus the incredible power of the DNC doesn't actually, the DNC is more powerful yeah. than money. So. Yeah. I mean, who even watches any kind of commercial anymore? Ever. When was the last time you sat through a commercial? I wait for the five second thing on YouTube to it so I can skip it. Yeah. yeah. What does but this yeah. money actually get the candidates? I mean, I don't understand they need, they need a staff. I mean, they don't stuff envelopes anymore. They don't send mail. They don't, they don't, nobody watches their ads. If they do have a good ad, it gets picked up by free media. What exactly do they spend their money on? I mean, who? Have well, you ever I mean, that's why Bur- the dollar that was spent. Yeah, well, that's why Bloomberg put all that money into social media stuff and like, you know, um, getting all these like you know, quote unquote influencers on Instagram to like post things about. And I love that uh, uh, Josh, uh, the fat Jew, uh, was like, you know what? I, I'm not going to do this. It's just like beneath me. <laughs> Who's the fat yeah, like, like, scumbag? One like, thing. All the jokes that you write. Yeah. 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 You fucking scum sucker. <laughs> yeah, but he wouldn't take—he really wouldn't take the that. money from Bloomberg, but he will take your joke if you're not looking. Yeah, Biden yeah. returned Louis' money. Unbelievable, unbelievable. Yeah, it's, that's an I embarrassment. That—that that is so fucking ridiculous that he would do that. I mean, if it's—it's it's these things of like, if you just let it happen, you don't go out of your way to try to make it go away or whatever. The the story is not going to get picked up, you know. But it's inc- it's incredible with with um, with Biden who he says, and I think there's actually a point to be made, is being falsely accused of sexual assault by somebody. It's a woman saying that he forcibly penetrated her in some way versus a guy who everybody agrees jerked off consensually. But, oh, it was a power dynamic. But he's returning the money because he doesn't want to be associated with that because it's an accusation. And then there's an accusation against him, which is a thousand times worse. And, you know, believe women. I mean, should maybe Louis should try to take something away from him. I mean, his vote, I hope, but it's, it's incredible. I mean, it's really, really amazing. It, the, the hypocrisy on the left is insane that they weaponized Believe Women and, you know, uh, with a whole entire Kavanaugh thing. And then now that these allegations against Biden come up, they're like, well, you know, it's a gray area on both sides. Well, they said the right thing now. They said the right thing is like, listen to women. That's of course you should. Yeah. I don't believe them. That's insane. <laughs> Just listen to people who have comp- and, and adjudicate them and take right. them to the courts or, you know, I mean, it's just, it's common you sense. You believe Tara Reid? I don't, no. You don't? Why not? No. Um, there are two pieces recently, John Chait wrote one um, in uh, New York I don't magazine. believe John Chait, but go ahead. Yeah, I know, I know, I know. But the Politico piece about, about her ever-shifting story um, is strikes me as, and look, I mean, you also, like Woody Allen said this about the allegations against him. You would, you tend to have a lot of them. 
you tend to have more than one, more than just this isolated thing. And by the way, uh, Woody Allen's memoir, which uh, wasn't, almost wasn't published, is very good. And, it, it, and if and someone recommends it, listen to the audio book, which he reads. It's very funny. It's a, great his, it's a great history of the you know, 60s and 70s comedy. And like, you know, he makes the case in a very sort of long and involved way about why he was screwed. And like, look, I never, no one ever accused me of this before. And that's the same thing with Bi Biden strikes me that too, but her claims have shifted a lot. In right, but do you agree with the following? That for, the, the, that for her, for it not to be true, she's, she's been making this up for, she made it up 25 years ago. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. which is what it's I- It's changed, I mean, it's changed a lot. And I, I don't, it, it, you can also not believe her by thinking that something awkward did happen and um, it got swollen to something rather different over time. Um, because the, 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 you know, the story has changed, right? I mean, so we, well, we know that. The thing is, it didn't come out during his vice presidency, did it? No. Yeah. <gasps> no, no. The what thing is that you have, you have her husband who described something traumatic. You have her mother who called up Larry King, and you have two friends who say they heard this story yeah. uh, uh, verbatim um, back then. So... Look, it makes it more credible than a lot of the Kavanaugh stuff, to be honest. Yeah. So I'm not like, sure that, yeah. Unless it's a conspiracy theory, unless it's a conspiracy theory, which I'm, I'm not by a conspiracy theory, that to me says that she she told this story back then. What happened? What happened to Dan? You railroaded him. He's so offended by your yeah. my apologizing for rape. Did he yeah. get mad at me? I was in the middle of a sentence. He was trying to talk and he kept going. I think he left. <laughs> okay. right. He doesn't care about the defense of rape. He cares that you wouldn't let him speak. All right, well, I mean, that's a good way to end. Yeah, maybe that's a good <laughs> way on the way out. Look, I don't know enough about it. I've read a bit of it, and some of it made me skeptical, but I'll, I'll, I'll read more about it. No, because like, I don't know that there's, a, that there's an election going on. It doesn't feel like there's one. I feel like she could have been making it up 25 years ago. I, I think that's totally plausible. I, what I don't think is plausible is that this was something about, I mean, it's just too much evidence that she told this story back then to say this is because of Bernie Sanders or Putin or any of that stuff. But yeah, I've, yeah, yeah. I've had false claims within my organization and why if you made a false claim why wouldn't you stick to it you know so it's certainly plausible that she that it's a false claim yes yeah, i it mean is and where i i know people who have been on the other end of that too and it's not just an assumption it's i know literally for a fact um that they're false so you know i mean it's it's incredibly destructive and the burden of proof is the sort of ordinary burden of proof you'd have in a in a, a criminal proceeding but like some of the witness stuff of like this one in Politico that she lived with these people a couple of years ago very progressive people and I don't think they're I don't think they're like Biden supporters or, or or Biden haters or whatever but it just seemed like she was she was not very stable yeah I think we also have to come to terms with something that that I really think is true which is high profile claims are more likely to be false than the everyday claims because yes, yes. There's extra, for, for someone who's not quite sane, there is the extra motivation that you can get a whole lot of attention this way. It's uh, totally different if 10 women accuse, you know, somebody at the Comedy Cellar um, who's not famous versus 10 women accusing Brett Kavanaugh, who is like the focus of every amount of media attention in the United States and it's going to be on the Supreme Court. They're like, oh, well, you know, it's 10. It's like, yeah, no, I get it. And you should look into all of those. But is 10 the same, afforded the same weight when you are Donald Trump versus, like, if my mailman had 10 people, I'd be like, that guy's guilty. Right. <laughs> versus exactly. if a guy who's really famous and is like, you can get some attention, you can go on Larry King, you can do it. Larry King's not even still alive, is he? Is that, like, he's still alive, but he's not doing it. He's still alive, show. yeah, he's still alive, yeah. He was doing a show for RT for a little bit, by the way. You know that, right? Yeah, that's pretty good. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think it's different depending on depending on who it is. I mean, context matters, but when you flatten all this stuff and say believe women, do this, do that, it's like I don't don't give me instructions. Just give me the evidence, and we'll look at it, and it's true or it's not true. I feel like that's how people. Feel about, I feel like that's how people feel about wearing masks. They're like, don't tell me what to do. I'll I'll do the evidence. I'll whatever. But if it's not a law, I'm not fucking doing it. You know? But the difference in there is that you know if you and I disagree on Brett Kavanaugh, I don't infect you. 
I don't, I can infect you with my ideas. I mean, you that's can the thing about the you can, if, uh, you can infect me with annoyance and tweet at me and, you know, annoy me online, which, which is worse, you know? I'm feeling bad about Dan. Um, we we got to wrap it up. We didn't get to talk about Arbery, but... Uh, if, oh, what a shame. Thank God. Uh, yeah. Uh, no, but it's an, ama- it's an amazing case. And every day the, the, the new revelations are like yeah. a Hollywood, Hollywood level. No, right? I mean, it's, it is. And as I, I said to a friend of mine, I said, you know, it's best as we saw with Covington, as we saw every case that it becomes the flashpoint, just hold off. Wait till the evidence comes in. Because what it seems that day from the video you see could be a million things. And I don't know. I mean, what I see is horrifying. Um, and I don't know what has changed, but. Yeah. Oh, you didn't hear about what happened today? Oh, is there something today? No, I was yeah. out all day. Or, or that um, it turned out that the police asked McMichael to, to keep an eye on things for them. Oh, wow. What? And that the, <laughs> that the property uh, owner, the property owner had been texting the police numerous times, including with footage going back to October. Oh, when he and, said the guy next door is a cop, give it to him? Yeah. He said, yeah, yeah. Here's his number. He can help you if you need it. And they were playing cat and mouse with this guy. Um, and so much, so much of it is inexplicable because he didn't, he didn't ever take anything, apparently. Maybe and, he was just, like, autistic and just, like, loved buildings or something. Well, no, somebody made of maybe he's getting a drink of water when he's running. I mean, that, that's, you know, who, who knows? But they were playing cat and mouse with this guy, but the police had engaged McMichael and put him into this situation and suggested that, you know, he be contacted if there's a problem. Yeah. And, and it was another thing that, I don't know if it's true, but it was oh, interesting. it's so horrible. The, the daughter said that she hasn't dated a black, she hasn't dated a white guy in something like 10 years. And her father has treated every one of the, her boyfriends like a son. Now, of course that could be total bullshit, but it might not be bullshit, you know? Um, so, it just looking That's less- the hardest time. The hardest thing is to prove the motivation because you can still say that that is the most outrageous thing of like, you know what? A guy's in a building site. He's not doing that. When I was kids, we used to hang out in building sites of like places that were like, we just hang out and smoke cigarettes. Yeah. Like, so what? You know, a guy didn't take anything. Come out with a gun. The problem with the cops that is often obscured by the singular focus on, on identity and, you know, sometimes that's totally necessary. Obviously, I'm not to discount that in any way. But is the fact that sometimes people are power hungry and power mad. I mean, you see a lot of this with cops in the inner city. Like, you know, New York is a, you know, majority minority police force. And cops can be dicks. I mean, there was a thing that guy was thrown on the ground for not wearing a mask. Or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and it's like, I don't think that cop was white. And I mean, there's just a thing. Like, I was I've so had happy the cop cops. wasn't white. I know. I was, oh my God. <laughs> so I, 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 I put avoid... banners up in my apartment. Yeah. I had a party. Yeah. I was so excited. It's like, it's just police brutality in its yeah. own oh. generic way. Oh, oh my God. <laughs> but no, it, who knows? I mean, we, it's hard to, yeah. to, to determine what's what the Power hungry. Are. Power yeah. hungry. And for the I, police to say, hey, buddy, you're in charge. Wow, I used to be a cop. I'm back at it. Let's get, get the it. gun. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, I think that the. Who knows? I think, it's hard to say. It's hard to say. I think that the uh, the Georgia, the state of Georgia, should get hit with a nice fat lawsuit here. Yep. I totally. And, that's, so, and yeah. that's actually way better for the family mm-hmm. than the guilty verdict could ever with, be. Without a doubt. But I, my thing is that we're focusing so much on Arbery and not enough attention is being given to Breonna Taylor that the EMT, that the police, plain coast cops, knocked her door down and just murdered her because they were at the wrong house. That is so atrocious and so disgusting. And the fact that that conversation is not going on nationally, we're we're affected with Arbery is like insane. Maybe I'm guilty of that. The reason I'm focused on Arbery is because it seems like- what was it? Because, because it seems like a lot of ambiguities there, which I find interesting to delve into. When I see a clear cut case, I'm like, that's horrible. And, you know, then I may, maybe I should attempt to talk about it more. I mean, just- the one thing that seems unambiguous is there's no case for self-defense. The guy wasn't armed. There's no, I mean, you, you're not deputized as an ex-cop no, gra- to go chase somebody down. Yeah, there's- I mean, you're, just, you're going out to, you know, with a gun, is somebody who was just in a building site, even if they were there habitually, that, that's insane. I mean, it's like, what Total are you doing? Insanity. Grabbing yes, I, a gun. Think- Let the cops do that. Stop playing cop. If you want to be a cop, go back to being a cop. As an ex-cop, yeah. it doesn't mean anything. Uh, the problem is, and we did a deep dive in it, the problem is that Georgia actually has a law 
which allows yeah, yeah, Christina yeah, yeah, yeah. arrest for misdemeanors. Yeah. Georgia, Georgia also believes that you can bring your gun with mm -hmm. you anywhere you want as long as you don't point it at somebody. Mm -hmm. And if he yeah, didn't- No, but no, it's, it's legal to have sex with animals in, I think, nine states still. You can fuck an animal in Vermont. <laughs> you probably legal. shouldn't. <laughs> Doesn't mean that you should. No, no, we're not Doesn't arguing mean... about whether we should. Hey, no, I'm, I'm fucking my cat, man. It's, no, no, it's no. part of the law. But the question, no, if, if you want to, depends what the conversation you want to have. You want to say, should he do that? I think there's pretty clear nobody thinks this is wise. Question is, will they be convicted or should they be convicted? Would the law dictate that they be convicted? It's a much tougher case than people it's realize. It's a tougher case, yeah, for sure. Because, for unless, sure. It, because it doesn't look like he pointed the gun at them. It looks like Arbery ran and grabbed the gun and you see, and he moves backwards in the video. So the question is, up until that point, have they broken the law? Because if they haven't broken the law up until that point, then they actually do have a good case for self-defense because I haven't broken the law and a guy grabbed my gun and I shot him. Yeah, and he the grabbed the gun because he was cornered and scared. It was fight or flight, you know? So it's- Well, the, law, the law is crazy. He was the acting in defense out of fear, you know? Yes. If, if I turned around and there was a guy with a gun running out of me, who knows what I'd do, yeah. Especially if, you know, Noam, you showed us the other night at the Google Maps, he was just cornered and having cars coming yeah. at him every which yeah. way. Yeah, I, I, this is the problem with all the conversations. That's not that's not necessarily relevant to the law, as far as I understand. If if you have a right to make a citizen's arrest, presumably there's many scenarios where you make a citizen's arrest where somebody might get scared. If you, the Georgia seems to have this ridiculous law that allows you to take your gun with you and make a citizen's arrest, and um, the problem may be with that ridiculous law. Even if they get, even if they convict him, it might be the kind of thing which a, a court might have to overturn on appeal if they can't show that he was actually breaking the law. Crazy. And that's so incredibly Maybe. sad and disheartening. Yeah, it's hard. And I wonder if that's why DePaulo moved down to Georgia. <laughs> <laughs> I said DePaulo already put a bid on that guy's house. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It was DePaulo's house. <laughs> hey, check on the neighbor for me. Yeah, what are you talking about? He's running around with a gun. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> when you add into it that the police actually invited this guy to become involved in it. It's yeah. psychotic. It's disgusting. Psychotic. Right? If you don't trust the police because they're power-hungry assholes, you're going to trust random citizens with guns is probably... Well, it's a risk for disaster. Law no, he's former law enforcement. I, 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 I like, a citizen's care. arrest is yeah, like... who cares? What, like, what is he doing? You can't, like, farm out, like, police work. Like, yeah, what he's not that? a subcontractor on the house he's, he's <laughs> going into. He ain't a plumber, Noam. No, yeah. but he has a right to... I mean, God forbid anybody thinks I'm defending this behavior. I'm yeah, not. Yeah, yeah. I'm just... He has a right. I know you're speaking to the law, but people he has aren't a right smart to enough make to sit back and go, well, the law, they've already chosen sides. This is if what this, I would say. If these people get off, it's going to be such a racial fucking insane thing if these people get off. They have to say, fuck the law. They're guilty just to keep civil unrest. Uh, that's, that, that's, that's, never, that's never okay, in my opinion. If I, were the, if I were the lawyer, I would say, listen, jury, this is horrible, and I, I know you don't think... This what a great happen. closing argument, Noam. Um. Yeah. No, I would. I say, and, <laughs> Listen, and I Jerry. And I don't expect you to. I Listen, don't expect, Boomer. I don't expect you to think this is okay, but uh, unfortunately, the Georgia legislature created this law and this mechanism, this structure, and my client had the right to avail himself of this legal structure. That's what it means to be a criminal. You have to break the law, and therefore. Um, as angry what as about I, the poor kid that was we need to change the law. We, you're talking we need about self-defense for them. What about this poor fucking guy that was doing self-defense for him? At what point do you do you go? Okay, well, it's it's like a moot point wh whether or not legally it was okay to do. This poor fucking kid died. Yeah, got killed. Right, got like got surrounded and gunned down. I mean, that's the difference in why you have police, because when you turn around and there's a guy in a uniform with a badge in a yeah. cop car, you're like, okay, put that shit down. When it's some random guy in overalls with a, with a shotgun running after you, Jesus I, oh, grabbing the gun doesn't seem like the most irrational decision to make. I, I just saw a video today of these two hicks. One had a shotgun, one had a regular gun, and they got in an argument with a guy in the woods 
and they murdered this guy. He goes, you come within three feet of me. I'm in my legal right to shoot you. And the guy goes, the fuck you will. And boom, 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 they murdered him. This is a video? Yeah, it was on Twitter. It, it fucking blew my mind. Wow. It's insane. You know, like yeah, guns. That up. Once you bring guns, like like you said, if you're an officer, you go, hey, wh- whatever. But a random guy, you're in fight or flight and you're in absolute self-defense mode. You don't know if they're going to rob you. You don't know if they're going to murder you, which they did. It's like inexcusable what they did. Well, I know yeah. we were finished and and I pushed on this point, but I'm glad we did because that's that's some interesting stuff. So yeah, I didn't I, know that I had to look up the stuff that happened today. Yeah, it's, it, and, the, and look, and if you look up the Georgia laws, I mean, it's just stunning the the structure that they've created there where this actually could be legal. And, yeah. Yeah, but then hopefully they'll change it. Fuck a goat, because it's legal there. Yeah, th- what animals are you allowed to fuck? Any animals? Any animal, baby. Seriously? You put on Trent Reznor, I want to fuck you like an animal and just go to a farm and live your best life. Is that really true? There are nine states that you can fuck any animal you want? Yeah, look it up, Noam. Do your little... Do is, that, is, that, is that more horrifying than eating them? <laughs> it's a good I'm meme. literally going to have a steak after <laughs> this. And it's a little different than like fucking a llama. I, I, think, I think if you fuck it before you eat it, it's going to taste a little different. <laughs> yeah, but David Tell used to say, if the horse didn't like it, why'd she get so wet? <laughs> <laughs> That's what Tell used to say. All right. Uh, pa- 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 I want to make one point too. It's yeah. not an affirmative thing in the sense that the nine states aren't like, you can fuck. It's just there's no laws against it. So yeah. they're not like they're not. Yeah. It's not like in the charter of like New Hampshire, like live it's free not or die. The, it's not in the fuck tourism a video to <laughs> visit Utah. That's what it is. Thank you for having me, Noam. Thank you, and thank you, Michael. Hey, hey, I'm so, I have thanks. one question. I have one question. Can you tell us about your cover art? Because it really is so amazing. No, we haven't got time for that now. We have we have to go. Ah. Oh, oh, hey, let's talk about Ahmad Arbery for 20 more minutes. I know, Hold really? on. <laughs> talk about your cover art. Go ahead. I'll put it, it, I'll put it, I'll put it up while you talk. Go ahead. It's, it's by an artist. His name is Jeffrey Tice. He's a comedian and he's an artist. Look him up. He does incredible art for comics. He's done tour posters for comics. He really helps them out. Oh, and if, if, you, if you like the cover art, go support him. He's an incredible artist. And uh, it, it was very kind of him to do that artwork. So thank you for giving me the chance to, to say that. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, the only reason he cut it off was because I said it, if any, not not because it was your artwork. <laughs> no, I feel like, I feel like, I feel like uh, Michael's been here a long time, right? And I feel like I'm really upset about Dan. And he's fine. Um, I just spoke to Dan. He's fine. I mean, he was like annoyed that he felt like he couldn't get a word in and he's going to have a social distancing drink with somebody. Probably my uh, but maybe we should be more mindful yeah. about, you know, letting him talk. And Well, I'm going to go back and review the tape because as I recall, I, I brought up something and then I was trying to actually finish the point that I was trying to make. Yeah, you're just like We're, reviewing a lot of tape in your house now. I mean, no, <laughs> it's a lot of like, he uh, grabbed a gun and then coach. he got up. Yeah. You are a football coach reviewing tape for a game you're never going to win. <laughs> I, I need you to send it to me, Perry, because I got to cut. I got to cut one little rem- have remark. You, have you like, sorry, Dan? Like, we're sorry you got frustrated. Like, not go back and look at the fucking tape. <laughs> but I do want you to send it to me because I want. I want to. Uh, I want to. Yeah. I want to edit something. I send said. him an edible arrangement. Don't look at the tape. I mean, really? Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to go back. You get into an argument with Juanita. You're like, I'm going to go back and look at the tape. <laughs> I mean, no one needs a court stenographer just to have a friendship with someone. (laughs) Okay, I can tell you you how how far right you are because we had my my wife and I had an argument in her office the other in our house, her office the other day, and we I didn't say yes, you did. I didn't say it, and I went to the kid monitor camera to the way, and I boosted the audio all the way up and compressed it to try to hear what the conversation actually was to be You're sure. kidding me. No. And I, and, I, and I was able to hear it. You are the richest. It's like Nick the fucking the Zapruder show. film. <laughs> <laughs> but I didn't tell her that I was right. Yeah. Back in So you the did that and you didn't even tell her at the end? No, that would be, if I pointed out to her that I was right, that would have just made things worse. If I just wanted oh. to know. Did she oh know that you listened to the audio on the kid's camera? Well, That's she will now, because I'm going to send her this episode. That is so insane. No, you got to get out of the house, buddy. Yeah. 
Yeah. No, I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna ride my I, bike. I to get my wife out on a bike ride. All right, all right, guys. Ian, where can we find your album on uh, iTunes? You can just search my name in iTunes. Uh, look me up on Instagram at Ian Fidance, ianfidance.com. And I, I'm grateful I got to be here. Michael, I'm a huge fan of yours. I love your work. Thanks, yeah, man. We love you, Michael. I appreciate yeah. it. And I uh, love coming back. And uh, yeah, I have something on Showtime on Sunday. So Where, 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 when, who? It's on what? Showtime on The Vice Show on Showtime. Um, and my buddy, Ben Anderson, has a far superior piece on the same episode from Burkina Faso, which is really good. But, um, but yeah, so that's, that's that. But it was, it was lovely to see you guys, and I really appreciate you having me on again. Thank you, Michael. Thank, Thank you, you, Ian. We love you guys. Where are you send, send me those files when you finish, okay? Yes, I will. For the love of God. <laughs> we love see you, Dan. Bye. Bye. And you can email us at podcast at comedycellar.com and at live from the table on Instagram.